My name is Chris Coyne, and I'm the F.A. Harper Professor of Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University and the Associate Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. Today I'm joined by Robert Higgs, who is a Senior Fellow in Political Economy at the Independent Institute and is the Editor-at-Large of the Institute's quarterly journal, The Independent Review. Bob, welcome. Thank you very much, Chris. So in addition to understanding the historical episodes and, and, and providing um, a, a alternative history compared to the conventional view, mm -hmm. one of the, the main takeaways that I, I think comes out of this strand of work um, is that when the government engages either in warfare or in security or defense, whatever you want to call it, it has to pull real resources out of the private sector. It has to redirect the entrepreneurial alertness of private actors, and it redirect those, redirects those things from, from satisfying consumer wants, private consumer wants, to satisfying the government. I think this is an important point beyond the episode of World War II because a lot of people to this day uh, make two, two related arguments. One is one you brought up earlier, which is the military Keynesianism type argument, which is that government spending on military or defense related activities somehow contributes to economic growth by stimulating spending. The second one is that government spending on security, defense, what, what have you, creates opportunities and products and services that otherwise wouldn't exist because mm -hmm. basically the government is, is sponsoring or subsidizing scientific research. Right. Um, do you see that this relating directly to some of the insights that, that you raise in, in this body of work? I, I do. Uh, I, I think the idea of regime uncertainty is a general idea. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been applying it to uh, events since 2008, uh, and I've written a number of, in this case, fairly small scale uh, uh, articles uh, to, to demonstrate that the same kinds of evidence I adduced to show regime uncertainty in the late 1930s have shown increases in regime uncertainty since 2008 as well. Uh, so I think that has uh, something important. I don't know how much, but something important to do with the uh, slow rate of recovery uh, from the, the uh, recession that began in the beginning of 2008. Uh, and in some ways, uh, it has not ended yet, even though we're now in uh, 2016. So th this, is a, this is a great duration uh, of its own. Uh, it's, it's not comparable, of course, with the magnitude of uh, the 1930s Great Depression, but it's similar in kind, and I believe it has, uh, to some extent, a similar explanation. Uh, now, another thing I haven't touched on that that's, that you're now raising here is the is the question of how people react uh, when the government increases the level of regime uncertainty, and, and it's not simply that they 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 reduce the volume of long-term investment. It's that what they do undertake is different in character. Uh, obviously, some people will, will try to butter their bread by producing things the government wants. Uh, and if, for example, the government is subsidizing certain kinds of products or certain industries, then that will attract resources uh, to be invested in those places. So uh, nowadays, for example, the government subsidizes so-called green businesses and green enterprises. And th this almost always turns out to be just a way of wasting money on uh, uh, paying large amounts of money to, to, to corporate cronies. Uh, but it, you know, it can be uh, uh, environmentally, uh, allegedly environmentally friendly automobiles. It can be uh, solar panels, or it can be all sorts of things that, that fly under this banner. Uh, but the fact is that now you've got investments being made. You're changing the structure of the capital stock in ways that would not be viable uh, without these government subsidies. Uh, uh, so even, even though you've had, uh, in both the late 1930s and since 2008, you've had a higher level of, of regime uncertainty, and that has discouraged uh, long-term investment in general, You've also had, in both cases, a distortion of the capital stock because of uh, where people choose to, uh, to restore the stock when it uh, becomes uh, old or depreciated, obsolete. Uh, do they 
Do they reinvest? Uh, in some cases, they would, but for the regime uncertainty. In other cases, they make new investments, even long-term investments, that they wouldn't make, uh, except that the government has mixed the regime uncertainty with subsidies and changes in regulation that, that make these investments look as if they're potentially profitable. So, so they're, when government intervenes, it, it, it creates many kinds of effects. And uh, e economists often seize on one or another of them. But, uh, but there, are, there are multiple effects, and they interact. Because uh, when you distort the structure of, of production, you, you have an effect, for example, on the relative costs of raw materials and, and intermediate products in the industrial sector. And that is, in some ways, a bigger part of the economy than the final goods and services part. There's been some research to show that. In fact, there are even attempts now to systematically take into account how much economic activity is going on at the intermediate levels uh, that don't get taken into account by GDP accounting where we, we look at only final, final goods and services when we add up the so-called total output of the economy. But, but of course, uh, a lot of action takes place within the capital structure itself. And when the government either creates uncertainty or, or distorts uh, production uh, with, with, uh, with tax changes, with, uh, with subsidies, with, with regulatory changes that affect different industries differently. It, it distorts the capital structure and that has effects on the operation of, of unrelated activities, and different kinds of outputs. So, you know, the economy is such a complex and delicately interrelated uh, web of evolving relationships and connections that, that it's, it's really impossible for anybody, even the most dedicated Austrian, to identify all of these connections. They're, they're, they're almost endless. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, the, the proposal to intervene uh, represents a level of hubris that uh, cannot withstand critical scrutiny. Uh, economics has become very interventionist ever since the 1920s, uh, not just in the United States, but uh, all over the world. And certainly macro intervention has swept the field since the 1940s. Uh, but the intervention is always based on a very impoverished conception of what the economy is and how it operates. A very simplified, mechanical, small scale, highly aggregated view. It's like this simple machine. Oh, you put uh, something in here and something pops out there. But in fact, the real economy is is countless millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people all doing things that, if you track them close enough, relate to one another. We're all related. You know, it's not just that we all come from Adam and Eve and we're related that way. <laughs> we, uh, uh, we're, we're all related right now in this huge world through the intricacies of the, uh, of the great division of labor that, that uh, Adam Smith visualized for us uh, perhaps well for the first time and, uh, and, and others, uh, particularly Austrians, have, have visualized uh, uh, in a more uh, in a precise way uh, from time to time uh, since then. But, but uh, uh, Austrian economics does not lend itself well to uh, interventionism uh, at all because uh, it, it, it's aware of the hubris that has to sustain those interventions.